Hello. Ahlan. Masa al khair jamian. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, have you had your lunch and feeling comfortable? And this is Ala Alban. And we're talking about the future cities. Uh, the uh, session uh, will be in English and we will be starting now. What does the city of tomorrow look like? How can we ensure that it amplifies generation transformation ability to lead change? This session will look at cities as the ultimate community experiment at scale, bringing together generations and people from all walk of life to live work and interact with one another, deeply redefining our social fabric. It will also explore how generation transformation can create a sense of community and belonging with new urban ecosystem. I would like to welcome our speakers today in this session, City of the Future, Jerry and Zerlo, Group CEO, Dar'iya Gate Development, Saudi Arabia, and David Henry, <laughs> and David Henry, CEO, Mohammed bin Salman, Nonprofit City, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I would leave each guest to talk about their esteemed experience and their esteemed uh, company. Please, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alban. Salam alaikum, my dears. Today is um, particularly a great honor for me because of MISC and what MISC represents. Um, with today, I think we have to give our love and our gratitude to the custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman, because if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have Derea and we wouldn't have our UNESCO World Heritage Site of Tadeif. And to thank, 10 years later, our dynamic Crown Prince, our Prime Minister, Mohammed bin Salman, for his leadership, because later this month, when the Kingdom for the first time hosts the World Travel and Tourism Council, first time in the history of Arabia, we will be opening phases of the Dedea 2030 Master Plan in 2022. A tremendous accomplishment for the kingdom. So it's a great honor, it's a great honor to be with all of you today and especially all of the young people that in this historic time in the kingdom have such a bright future ahead. So thank you for having us and uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be with you today, Dr. Alban. Thank you, Jerry. David? Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, as Dr. Albert uh, mentioned, I'm the CEO of uh, Mohammed bin Salman Nonprofit City. Um, I've, the previous uh, speaker talked about purpose. So, my um, 30 years of purpose uh, to date is to uh, be immersed in building new cities. And I've now done it on three continents uh, Australia, uh, Vietnam, and Asia, and the Kingdom. Um, I came here four years ago to set up the city. Um, with a mandate from the founder to build a real estate-led ecosystem for the youth of Saudi and the youth of the world. Um, a little bit of background to the project uh, before we get into it. It's a two million square metre mixed-use development. Uh, it's an emerging cultural district, as my, some of you may have already seen on our model, and as Dr. Bada referred to earlier this morning, um, it's going to home for most of the foundation subsidiaries. It'll be a um, residential community of close to 20,000 people. It'll be home to 25,000 workers and employees of companies we will attract there. It'll be an education ecosystem for nearly 6,000 students um, with the two schools we own, Riyadh schools and Miss School. Um, it's also a test bed for innovation. Uh, it's a talent catalyst. And I'd like to think after four years, we're, we're disrupting the way real estate development is taking place. And I hope at the end of this session, we'll, we'll explore that a little bit further. So I'd just like to thank um, 
the uh, team at the Foundation for having me here today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Great smart cities featuring technologies, infrastructure, and ecosystems that will seamlessly deliver exciting new ways of living, working, and playing local communities and urban life evolve. So David, what is the city of the future in general, and how can we shape it? Um, I think the cities of the future, and I think as many of us have traveled around the world, the cities of the future are generally expansions of existing cities. Uh, certainly the ones, apart from uh, the one I'm involved with, have been expansions of existing urban footprints. Mixed use, high density, and I think anyone in the real estate understands that's a challenge, but it's important to do. The other thing I think important for the cities of the future is proximity, living and employment, uh, which is a challenge even for the city of Riyadh as it tries to double its population. Education opportunities, and I'm very thankful that we will start off the journey of Mohammed bin Salman's city with opening of our first school. Um, it, you know, it's the concentration of well-being of future de generations which the cities of the future have to uh, come to grips with. I think uh, yesterday in COP27, the UN General Secretary mentioned that the world population just turned over 8 billion people. Most of the people from rural areas of Africa, of Asia, you name it, want to move to cities. So, you know, the challenge for the, um, the governments and the private sector globally, you have to uh, think about the, I suppose, the, the world will leave behind, particularly for the millennials and the Generation Zs who are really going to be the custodians of our cities. So the future of the cities um, is very challenging and I think it's a wonderful thing that in, uh, in Riyadh, they've set up the Riyadh Foundation and the think tank to address the challenges just for, just for Riyadh. I think it's a fa fantastic thing to be doing. So proximity of living is bringing the generations to together and it's part of our culture as well. So Jerry, how can cities be designed to promote culture, education, and help generation transformation live positive lives. Yeah, this is uh, probably one of the most important factors for the Crown Prince because working so closely with him, everything that I see with him has to do with quality of life. Mm -hmm. How do people interact? Is the society healthy? Are they happy? Are they fit? Are they entertained? So today is very interesting because the UNESCO World Heritage Site is the birthplace of the Arabian Peninsula. It's the birthplace of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's the ancestral home of Al Saud. And thanks to the Urban League, today it has been proclaimed as the center of cultural and heritage for 2030. So we are 14 by 14 square meters of development. And one of the great things is that the Crown Prince wants everybody to be outdoors and interacting. Mm -hmm. He wants today to be walkable in the middle of what's going to be a fantastic re-imaged um, Riyadh of 15 million people. But today it will have 100,000 people. But the entire culture heritage city is being built in the old mud typology. We're right now making 180 million mud bricks, the same way they were made 300 years ago. So if any of you feel like you want to play in the mud, let me know, and uh, we could use a lot of help making the 180, mud, 180 million mud bricks. But what we've done, which is super interesting, is under the surface of Didea, we've put in all of the smart city technology. So now above, in this historic city that will be the most, the largest cultural heritage city in the world, the jewel in the middle of Riyadh, you will be able to walk to the two universities, the big universities, to the 38 hotels, to the 20,000 residences. We will have five metro and rail, but it's all underground. 
we will have 40,000 parking spots. We, we just finished the first 1,400 in Bijeri that we will open up um, first week of December. So the Crown Prince's vision is to have people interact. But the most important thing is to preserve Saudi Arabia's rich, authentic culture and heritage. So there's a lot of Saudi food and Saudi music, a museum for Arda, for calligraphy, because we want people to come from all over the world and see the richness of Saudi Arabia and especially the warm welcome that Saudis are legendary for. So that's what the walking city of Dedea is in the new metroplex of Riyadh. So that's great, talking about the quality of life. <laughs> talking about the quality of life and the sense of generations bringing them together and the community and the proximity between schools, homes, and all of the amenities around um, people needs for their daily life. So David, how might cities of the future be developed with different generations in mind, with a view to fostering positive dialogue between generations, as well as enhanced living spaces? Um, I think if you, if you look at the example of what we're doing in um, our city, the, the challenge for a new city, which we are, is to, one, create a community before people are actually living there. So, the challenge is somewhat uh, mitigated a little bit, as I said, if you bring education, I'm talking for kindergarten, to senior school into a community earlier. The other thing which is a challenge for this, this culture a little bit is, is public meetings places. And I think anyone who lives in Riyadh has seen the lack of public meeting places. So uh, like Daria's doing it like we're doing, um, putting in high quality public realm both for informal and formal uh, gathering places, whether it's sports fields, whether it's public art exhibitions, allows the community to come together. Apart from organised community activities through the local mosque or through libraries or public events, which both our projects will um, eventually do with a whole lot of activation. So future cities, and particularly as I talked before about the expansion of existing cities, is the urban planners um, and the authorities have to provide more public meeting places. Um, clubs, again, I think there's been a big push under 2030 to start up a whole lot of, in our case, youth-led NGOs. Um, I think the NGOs and the um, philanthropic endeavours of the country uh, from His Royal Highness's point of view is to push the agenda in the GDP. So that's a good start. And as I said, coming from two other examples of meeting places and having community involved, they're the formulas I think you have to follow. The, the other part, a little bit, and it's a challenge all around the world, is, is as the ageing population uh, ages um, and the youth take over many cities, the, the very elderly in many ways are a forgotten part of the community. Um, they, so the aged care uh, businesses are different all over the world. Um, different cultures treat their elderly different. Um, equal access um, and disability opportunities in the city we're all looking at. And in particular, our, our project um, has about 50% of open space, which is very rare for communities around the world. So I think that's what the future cities need to look for, is um, as they spread out or they densify closer to the core CBDs is to provide a lot more open space as part of the, uh, the urban fabric. Wow. So you focused on the urban plan and the relationship between public to private spaces and active, and, um, um, active spaces and the dynamic between them. So maybe this is the new trends for the future of the cities. So that, David, will bring us to the next question. What are the global trends around cities that youth should be keeping an eye on? Well, as I said in my first comments, so the, I mean, the youth are the custodians of our future cities, so, and they're tech, technologically savvy. So take our project, for example. Um, being able to use your technology in a whole lot of areas, in particularly in climate change issues. 
uh, use of water, mm -hmm. use of electricity, mm -hmm. waste management, uh, mobility. They're all, they're all early ad uh, adopters of new technology, so they should be looking for communities or new cities where the developer or the local authority is conscious of water saving, power saving, management saving on uh, utilities generally. Um, I think they should look for communities where they can volunteer, and I know the foundation and many companies around the world uh, have their employees volunteer for climate impacting changes, such as tree planting, which this nation's going through, uh, World Cleanup Day, um, plastic clearing of mangroves, say, in, in the other parts of the Middle East. So I think, as I said, they, they have at their fingertips technology, which smart city in Daria, smart city here, smart cities all around the world, um, they have to adopt. And I look at Barcelona, um, who's generally regarded as one of the smart cities of the world. Pre-COVID, it was the most sought after destination for youth in Europe. And it has adopted many of these things, public open space, technology. And that's what I think uh, attracts people. And as we all know, we, trying to retain your staff, as we heard a previous gentleman, is a challenge. And the youth are our, our future. So the early adopts of technology is very important for the, uh, the smart cities and uh, the creation of them. So Jerry, what role might technology play in creating and enabling better city living? You see, the reason why I'm so excited about the younger generation now is compared to my generation, they don't take excuses. They want to know what you're doing now to protect the planet, to protect the city, to protect the community. Mm. They're much more engaged. So I think the technology enables them to not only communicate, but to advocate change and hold governments and private sector accountable, right? So even the whole use of electric cars now, very important. So with technology, they can, people can meet up with each other very quickly. So I, I agree with David and, and the brilliant job that's being done in the, in the MISP master plans. Mm -hmm. We will finish by the end of this month. Uh, come December, we'll open up two kilometers of the Wadi Hanifa. We're going to have so many, we have over 80 parks that have cafes. And now, you know, the Crown Prince came up with this brilliant idea, one of his many, to connect historic today to King Saud University. This will give us a today version where we will where we will pay tribute to, but we don't copy. We don't have to copy in, in Saudi Arabia. We have enough originality and authenticity. But we're going to have a Champs Elysees of of today, and that will have the new twenty thousand seat performance arena, the new opera house, the new convention center. Uh, it will have the new contemporary art museum, but that's filled with all cafes and art galleries and fashion houses where people can assemble. And with technology, them able to, you know, hook up together and, and meet, it not only holds us accountable, but pr it, it promotes socialization. And I think that, I think that gets everyone together. We'll have 100,000 people uh, by 2028. And really, we're catering to a much younger dynamic. Our housing now, you could rent, buy, or, or lease, but studio apartments, one bedroom apartments, two bedroom apartments, because the cultural district will be in, in Dedea, the tech will be in Dedea, the media will be in Dedea, and this will be young people. And that will give a great urban energy in the middle of this dynamic Riyadh. I agree with you, but the cities of the future also, they rely a lot on the, on the lessons learned from the past for the new generation and creating the making of the city of the future. So, Jerry, what can we learn from the past to inform the future of our cities and how we interact with them? Well, I think, I think there's, a beautiful, there's a beautiful scenario here in Saudi Arabia because you have the 300-year history of Dedea. This is the birthplace of the kingdom. It's a source of 
tremendous pride for all Saudis. This is the birthplace. So the future defines your values, who you are, your culture, but yet you can be so optimistic of the future that you can plan cities that are not even thinkable now, like Neom, the genius of Neom. But the, the genius of Neom is not defined in 2022 standards. The genius of Neom is 2032, 2042, 2052, but you could still celebrate your 300 year identity. So when people come to Saudi Arabia, they're gonna find a beautiful country. They're gonna find warm, hospitable people, a very young, engaged population. But they're gonna say, these, these people are responsible because they're not stuck with, re how do we reinvent London? How do we reinvent New York? We can look at things and learn from what urban, uh, urban mistakes were and correct them now, which we're doing. By the way, we've already planted six million bushes, shrubs, trees within Dedea, but we did it with smart city technology. Now we use affluent water, we recirculate the affluent water with the new drip technology. We replenish 24% of everything we, we do. This is smart. You don't see this in most cities. So you have to give tremendous credit to the crown prince and to his ministers that, that they're saying, what can, we, what can we take from the best of the best cities? And what can we leave behind that didn't work? Especially with traffic and mobility. That's why with today, where you walk, this beautiful, authentic mud city, but underneath it is super smart. All the smart city technology. While, of course, celebrating our rich culture. Of course. So thank you, David and Jerry, it was great to talk to you about the future, of the, the, the future of the city and also to learn more about Mohammed bin Salman, non-profit city and Dir'iyya. Um, I'm Ala Alban. I'm very proud to witness all of the changes that are happening and be part of it and uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of MISC here today. Ma <laughs> khallasna. <laughs> Final takeaways. Addressing our esteemed panelists in 30 seconds. 30. <laughs> Given the rapid change in technology that impact directly building a city's infrastructure, technology, and community, what are the three most important characteristic cities of the future should be addressing today to ensure healthy, sustainable growth. Let's start with David. Okay, um, my three takeaways, uh, and I'll be quite specific to the kingdom because that's where I'm spending my time. My, um, my concerns are, but they're also takeaways, is the, uh, the urban planning that's about to go throughout this metropolitan Riyadh and probably Jeddah and other cities needs to, um, I think, respect density. Mm -hmm. um, and I think without wanting to upset transport engineers, they have to get away from designing cities based on roads. And that flows right through to sustainability, mobility, you name it. The other thing I worry about for this country and also around the world is affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Diverse and affordable housing for the workers. Um, across all the boards because it's, not, it's a challenge here, it's a challenge everywhere. Uh, every country, federal governments, pension funds are trying to work out the problem. So I see that as an issue. Um, as Jerry mentioned, he's a range of housing. We, we will adopt all forms of housing mm -hmm. and ours is only for leasehold. And I think the other thing the future cities have to do is quickly adapt to all the issues we hear globally about sustainability. They have to adopt solar, they have to adopt uh, district cooling, they have to adopt uh, smart technology, mobility um, in their planning. And that's quite, it's quite challenging. Um, we've adopted it. As I said, we, we are probably a disruptor to urban planning, um, but we have to start somewhere. And I think the founders supported us so far with our master plan, as Jerry has. Thank you so much. Jerry. I think my three big takeaways are the society, especially Saudi, has to remain optimistic and positive. 
And I think this is one of the big advantages of Saudi Arabia now when you look at the G20. A lot of the countries now are very polarized. So if the kingdom can maintain its positivity and its optimism to a very bright future, that's a leadership issue. Um, the crown prince wants to get everybody outdoors. You know, we, we tend to be on our devices. We tend to be in, 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 you know, in, in your homes. So I think the public realm is important because that's where people gather. And when people gather, they share. And when they share, they get to know each other. And that, that breaks down conflict. And then we'll be able to welcome people from all over the world to a beautiful, very welcoming country. So I think we got to promote people to be outside. And I think we have to, all the young people have got to fight to preserve our unique cultural identity and heritage and celebrate all that's unique about the way we cook, the way we dance, the way we sing, the way we dress, the way we welcome people. Those would be, those would be my three takeaways. Thank you so much, Jerry and David. Um, I would like to end to the audience. Um, uh, as Jerry and David uh, shared that we need to share our experience in order to move forward and never forget who we are. And we always should be proud of our culture and our identity. Great talking to you. And thank you, audience, for listening. Thank you. Dr. Alban, may I say one thing? I'm going to say one thing, too. Dr. Alban is one of my heroes, Saudi woman, PhD, while raising five children. Thank you. Rock Thank star, you. huh? I'm going to say one thing. For those who haven't visited our uh, model, I'd love you to come and have a see uh, my team out there. It's, it's only part of the uh, scene, but it's most of what will open in t late 2024. So please be my guest. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Dream big. God bless you, everybody. Only one today, huh? <laughs> Thank you.